so let me start by briefly explaining what is dynamic graph algorithm what this field is all about so uh, you can pick your favorite graph problem that you studied in your introductory algorithms course say shortest paths matchings minimum spanning trees anything okay now uh, in the algorithms course in the classical algorithms course you are usually given a problem and you want to solve this problem as fast as possible so see for shortest paths you can single source shortest paths you can run diestras for minimum spanning trees you can run prince and kruskal's algorithm and these are pretty fast now in the dynamic graph algorithm the input graph as the name suggests is changing dynamically so at each time step either an edge is being inserted into the graph or an edge is being deleted from the graph and you want to maintain the solution so you want to maintain the shortest path information or the spanning trees or the matchings in this dynamic environment now what is the big deal after each edge insertion deletion you can run the static algorithm from scratch right that will give you a valid solution however can we do substantially better because we already have a solution to a graph that was that only differs from the current graph by only one edge right so can we reuse part of the solution and quickly update our current solution this is what dynamic graph algorithm is all about and as you can see that this question can be asked in the context of any graph problem okay so this field started in late 80s or early 90s although there are a few papers which can be termed as dynamic graph algorithms that appeared in the 70s as well but for practical purposes you can say that this field is 25 years old and now there is a huge literature on this sub field okay so first a brief outline of the course what is this course going to be you can think of this course in from three different perspectives one are the different problems that we are going to study in this dynamic setting so in terms of the problems i hope i will have time to cover all this but, but okay at least this is my goal but, we will be considering some several classical problems given a graph whether the graph is connected or not given any two nodes u v is u reachable from v connectivity then you can think of shortest paths right it can be directed or undirected graphs it can be single shorts or all pairs okay then you can think of reachability so reachability this is usually defined in directed graphs so you are given a directed graph and you are asked is there a path from node u to node v that is reachability okay you want to maintain this information in the dynamic setting then uh, of course you can think of matchings and vertex covers you want to find the maximum matching or an approximately maximum matching in the graph or vertex cover okay these are all very classical problems you will find these problems in the introductory textbooks on algorithms and we will study them in the dynamic setting so this is uh, with respect to the problems we will also see a surprising connection between dynamic graph algorithms and a different field which is known as streaming algorithms okay so we will see that often techniques from dynamic graph algorithms can be exported to streaming algorithms and vice versa how many of you are familiar with streaming algorithms what is a streaming algorithm okay so in a streaming algorithm uh, the requirement is the space that the edges in the graph are revealed to you one after another one at a time but you cannot store all the edges you have very uh, strict restriction on the amount of space you can use within that small space 
can you compute these properties say connectivity or short spots or so on okay it's a different field but there are some strong connections and then of course uh, we will spend quite some time on proving lower bounds for all these problems so dynamic lower bounds this will also be another topic so uh, there are no textbooks for this course not even I mean in monograph that I could point to that I could say that okay I will just teach everything verbatim from that monograph or that textbook what I will do is I will just pick some papers and present them the papers that I find interesting now here are some uh, caveats first of all it's a quite a big field so I will not even attempt to cover everything that has been done so there is so many variants of so many problems have been considered I'm not my main purpose would be to highlight certain key techniques certain key ideas that you can see in this field the second thing is that I am not going to present the tightest results for many of these problems say for example I will start with connectivity so uh, suppose there are two algorithms one runs uh, one has an update time of log n the other has an update time of log square n but the log square n one is much more simpler to explain so I will go with the simpler algorithm again the, uh, the thing is to highlight the main ideas not give the latest tightest result and finally I myself started working on this only less than a year back so uh, there are parts of this stuff that I myself do not know at this point say for example I know very little about dynamic lower bounds as we go along I will read up those papers and present them and so uh, do not treat me as an expert in dynamic graph algorithms I am not okay now the final uh, one final point about this organization how many of you are taking this for credit one two three four five six seven oh, okay good so uh, I will have multiple oral exams throughout the course and uh, the grades will be based on mainly those oral exams and possibly I might also ask you to uh, present some papers in the class uh, in the later half of the course okay and uh, so those of you who are crediting the course can you please uh, send me an email later on so that I know who exactly are the ones crediting the course okay okay so let me start with uh, as I said I will start with this problem dynamic connectivity and probably the first few weeks we will only consider dynamic connectivity we will see various techniques yes any question you said the dynamic is uh, on adding and deleting edges yes only edges? I mean like adding and deleting vertices is not, is not good. I mean uh, I'm guessing adding vertices is not much of a problem but deleting vertices yes that's a very the same as deleting edges that's a very good question the standard model in this field is that the edges are being inserted or deleted now there are certain models which is called the dynamic subgraph model where the nodes can get turned on and off but most papers stick to the edge insertion deletion model and one reason is that uh, okay if a node gets say turned on or off and it has say multiple edges <sighs> If the node has very high degree, you need to spend much more time, right? I mean, your update time will be uh, on the number of changes you are making in your solution. Okay, so inserting and deleting an edge, it's just one unit of change. Okay, so as I said, uh, for the first few weeks, probably we will just consider dynamic connectivity. In the static setting, the problem is very well understood. And but as we will see in the dynamic setting, still some very important questions are open. Okay, so what is dynamic connectivity? Let me erase this part. And I will also 
Okay, and another thing is that I am assuming that everybody is familiar with the introductory algorithms and data structures. So I am not going to motivate why connectivity is an important problem. Okay. Let me uh, precisely state the problem so that we get to know about some of the terminologies in this field. Okay. What is dynamic connectivity? Okay, first of all, let us think about static connectivity. What is this problem? So, usually the input is an undirected, say, simple graph G. And suppose we say that we want a data structure. such that it will pre-process the graph it will pre-process the graph and it will answer the following type of queries what is the query say uh, So you are given two nodes, U and V, and you are asking, do U and V belong to the same connected component in this graph? Okay. Now, in the static setting, still now we are in the static setting, right? How good the data structure is will be measured by the pre-processing time and the query time. These two are separate things. Okay. So this is pre-processing time, this is the first condition, second is the query time. Okay, so this is from algorithms 101, what will be the pre-processing time of a very simple data structure? Anybody? E plus V. Yes, E plus V. Right? Okay. Let us use one more notation. I, I, I will stick with this notation throughout this course. I will not define it anymore. Number of edges in a graph is M and the number of nodes in a graph is N. Okay. So, pre-processing time is O of N plus N, right? You just find a spanning forest. Simple. This will give you the connected components. What is the query time? How quickly can you answer the query? Anyone? Hmm? Order? N? Constant time, right? What is the query? You are just given a pair of nodes, tell me whether they belong to the same component. Can't you answer this in constant time? I mean, you can just put a marker on each node, which component it belongs to. And just check if the two markers are the same. There could be n components, right? Yes. Suppose that graph is of all world assets. Yes. But the node is going to be one component. So add is the fifth component. You have five units of function. Depends what is stored, right? After the processing, what is stored? He said, he said for every node, store a marker which component it belongs to. And then just check these two markers, right? So the pre-processing is, uh, the query time is constant. And you can see that this is optimum, okay? I'm not talking about space. You can also think what is the space requirement. The space requirement is also going to be linear, okay? But in dynamic graph algorithms, usually we do not care so much about the space. We mainly care about these things and one more thing. Uh, okay, this is the static setting, simple. What is the dynamic setting? Now, at each step, an adversary either inserts an edge into this set or deletes an edge. The node set remains fixed, okay? So, V is fixed and 
we call this thing an update. What is an update? Is either insert an edge uv into e. This edge does not currently belong to you, but you insert this. Or the update can be, sorry, delete uv. So, delete an existing edge from me. What your data structure needs to do? It needs to adjust itself, right? Because now it has a new graph after this update. So, here comes the third metric, update time. How quickly can the data structure adjust itself? That is called the update time. So, is the problem now clear? Very good question. It can be both. I am going to come to that right in two minutes. Okay. Now, apart from that question, whether this is worst case or average case, uh, let's just consider worst case for the time being. Okay. Is the problem clear? We want a data structure that optimizes these three matrix. Preprocessing time, query time and update time. And there might be trade-off. Okay. Okay. What is a very simple trade-off? Suppose, can you get constant update time? Let me erase this part. Okay. Because now we are in the dynamic setting. And usually we want the preprocessing time to remain linear. We don't want the preprocessing time to be very high. Okay. Or we are linear. So you know this notation, right? This hides some polylog in factor. Polylog with respect to M and N. Okay. Okay. Suppose I tell you now that give me a dynamic data structure with constant update time. Is it possible? Sorry? Maintain adjacency matrix to do the connectivity of the But how will it be constant update time? Uh, updates are just changing the values of A of U comma B. Oh, okay, okay, right. Okay, exactly, that is the question. But then what is the catch? What will be the query time? We also got M plus N. Query time will be order of M plus N. For each query, you just, you just do this thing from scratch, okay? Okay, very good. I am going to return to this in 10 minutes. But it will work only if edges are being inserted. Okay. So, the, on the other hand, suppose I tell you I want constant query time. Is there a data structure for that? Along with constant no, 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 no. Just constant query time. Update time can be anything. Yes, exactly. So, after each update, you just from scratch run a spanning forest algorithm. Okay? And then you can have constant query time, but your update time will be very high, right? Update time will be linear. Is that clear? Now the thing is, we want to minimize both of this. That is the goal. Okay. And of course, the lower the, these two quantities, the better. And usually in this course, again, as I said, I'm not going to be bothered about presenting the tightest result. I'll assume that it's good when both the query and the update times are some polylog in. Okay. I am not going to distinguish that much between polylog n and constant. Uh, later on, when we move on to lower bounds, then we will get to that. Okay. So, for the time being, at a very high level, the, our challenge is give a data structure that has polylog n query time and polylog n update time. Then you do that. Okay. And uh, at, at an even higher level, for any given uh, dynamic graph algorithms problem, the challenge is, can you do significantly better from uh, than running the naive static algorithm after each update or query? Can you do asymptotically better? That is the challenge. Okay. 
so these are the updates and the query is are you and be connected okay. and for the time being our goal is order of one update and query times okay when this field started in the late 80s or early 90s it was not known if this was even possible so the goal was to show that okay for some classical static problem can we achieve this goal because that would show that okay really we can do something much much better it's almost constant update time right i mean ignoring polylog in factors than running the static algorithms and then came after quite a few years there came two papers which basically solved this problem uh, at least in the amortized setting i am going to describe these two results shortly and uh, till now i think many people will agree that those two are the most celebrated results in dynamic graph algorithms so i will start with one of them later in the talk today okay now uh another thing worst case versus amortized say update time worst case update time is clear right i mean if i say that the worst case update time is log n then after every update the data structure takes care of it in log n time uh, how many of you are familiar with amortized analysis in static data structures i mean say self adjusting balance search trees and so on okay it's exactly the same thing here so if i say that amortized update time is log n it means if you give me a sequence of t updates it will take at most t log n times in total i'm going to be a little bit more precise and define the concept of amortized time now so that we have this thing in mind so suppose we give a dynamic connectivity data structure such that uh, m0 is the initial number of edges when you so in the beginning the graph has n zero edges and suppose now we have k updates k insertion deletions and suppose that we show that the total update time for the data structure is of the order of let's forget the big notation m0 plus k times order of pk then we are going to claim that the amortized update time is order of tk so note one crucial difference in this amortized analysis we are counting the initial number of edges this is the standard convention in this field or to put it differently you can say that you initially start with an empty graph when we are claiming an amortized update time you initially start with an empty graph then you make the insertion deletions the total time will be this clear and of course if we get worst case update time it's much more better than getting amortized update time okay any question so far yes Is the update time for one one update, right? And so, your total update time is equal to m not plus k into or g. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Is this clear? That was a mistake. Clear? Now, uh, the final thing is, this is the just the final notation that I will introduce, uh, terminology that I will introduce and then move on to the problem. Uh, it's called special cases, it's with respect to your question about union find. So we use this term that we are considering an incremental problem. This means if only age insertions are allowed. And it's a decremental setting. If only age deletions are allowed, and otherwise we say that this is fully dynamic. So this means both insertions plus deletions. Okay. So of course we want fully dynamic algorithm but in many places I mean even getting an incremental or a decremental algorithm might be very hard. Okay. So to recap how our goal now is to yes. So decremental and about text, does that definition still hold good that n not plus k seems somewhat contradictory? Why? I, I want decremental. Say I say I start with the complete graph. Mm -hmm. Do I have do I allow n squared into t time extra? That seems somewhat weird. I mean, if at all I want the number of non-edges to be added or something. Good question. Good, good point. For decremental, if you mean amortized update time, you cannot include m0 there. But I introduced this definition only for the fully dynamic case. Okay. So the fully dynamic is that I'm not just yes. Yes. Or in other words, one alternate way of viewing that definition is when you are talking about amortized update time in the fully dynamic setting, you start from an empty graph. That's the other way of looking at it. Okay. So now our goal is to consider dynamic connectivity, fully dynamic connectivity and give polylog an update and query time. Okay. So let us start. What? Let us see where is this, where is the main difficulty for solving this problem. First question, can we actually solve incremental connectivity quickly? Suppose edges are only being added and not deleted and suppose you start from an empty graph. Can you give me an, uh, a data structure with small query and update times? Exactly. It's, you can see that it's exactly union find. How many of you are familiar with union find from your data structure course? Okay, so in the union find you are just given a collection of objects. So this can be solved by the union find data structure. You can look it up in say Coleman or any other algorithms. What am I saying? Sorry. This is union find data structure. So you are just given a collection of objects and so these are your items. And these items are grouped into subsets. These subsets are mutually exclusive. And you can 
have two queries. One is the find query. So what is find v? Or you can say find u and v. It basically just says that, okay, I am giving you just two objects. One is u, the other one is v, it lies somewhere. Do they belong to the same subset or not? And the other one is union query. So this is an update and this is a query. This is the query and this is the update. So when you say union u comma v, what it does? It looks at the set that contains u, looks at the set that contains v and just merges them into a single set. Okay. And this is the update, this is the query and uh, the, the very simple data structure but the analysis is quite complicated. Gives an update time that is uh, amortized update time that is alpha of n where n is the inverse accordant function and the query time is I think also alpha n or something. Okay, I, I just need to check, but it's pretty small. It's definitely less than log. Very name should be similar. Yeah. Not the of the part. Yes, right, right, right. Yes, it's exactly. Okay, so now how can you use this data structure to solve incremental connectivity? So here, these things are the elements, right? Okay, in this union find data structure, these are the elements. So suppose I am given this union find data structure, how can I solve incremental connectivity? The nodes in the graph, in the input graph will be the elements, right? And the connected components will be the sets. And when you insert an edge uv, you just do union of u comma v. You just merge the two connected components. That's it. Okay, now. So, the message is incremental connectivity is easy. What about decremental connectivity? Now we are getting into the most interesting part. Okay, let me use this. Let me tell you this, the hard part is the decremental thing and I cannot give you any formal argument for this but typically it so happens that in dynamic graph problems, if you can solve both the incremental version quickly and the decremental version quickly, usually there is a fully dynamic version that runs fast. Okay. Uh, I am at least not aware of any problem where both the incremental and decremental versions are easy but the fully dynamic thing, uh, at least in polylog and update time, if you look at the space of problems that gives you polylog and update time, I am not aware of any problem. I will be happy to be corrected. If you find any such problem, please let me know because as I said, I am just working on this field for the last few months. Okay. So the hard part is the decremental connectivity and let us just try to explore what is the main problem. One thing is clear, right? We are going to maintain a spanning forest. That's the natural thing to do. Okay. So suppose we are maintaining a spanning forest. Something like this. These are the uh, tree edges, the forest edges and these are the other non-tree edges or something. 
the non-free edges go within the same components, right? So here there are two components. The white edges are the free edges, the blue edges are the non-free edges. <coughs> Question one, what will happen if a non-free edge gets deleted? Is this easy to fix, the data structure? It's easy, right? Because basically nothing is changing. So the hard thing is when a tree edge gets deleted. Now, why is this hard? So, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you detect that? Or not like we are keeping the data structure. How do you detect that you gave me a touch? So are you keeping the scanning for which all the edges? So how do you detect by a particular edge? Hmm. Okay, good question. That's at a lower level detail where we will be using a dynamic tree data structure. I'm going to come to that after I explain this intuition. Okay. Uh, so, since I'm not a data structure person, usually how I think about the problems is that I think about the algorithms first. And once I have a high level idea as to how the algorithm will go, then I try to see what data structure I need to support this algorithm. So uh, this will be supported by dynamic tree data structure. I'm going to come to that later on. For the time being, we can just assume that say, we explicitly list these three edges in some data structure, okay? Now, why is this a problem? So just look at one component, right? And now suppose I tell you this tree edge got deleted. For the time being, just assume that the graph itself has contains only one component, okay, initially. This tree edge gets deleted. Now we have, say this is U, this is V. This part is set TU, the tree of U. This part is TV. Now we want to find if there is a non-tree edge that crosses this. If yes, we want to make this a tree edge. Otherwise, we are just going to note that, okay, now this thing has split into two components and we can just continue with these two trees, right? We don't need to adjust TU or TV anymore. Now, detecting this non-tree edge, this is called a replacement edge. I am just going to make this thing clear because I am going to use this thing. Terminology later. Just one second. This is called replacement edge. Yes, question? Mm -hmm. Suppose uh, a replacement edge exists. Mm -hmm. You said that there will be a shape layer. I mean, okay, so sorry. Suppose it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And you say we will divide it into two. Yes. But, uh, for each vertex, you are keeping a marker, right? To which component belongs. So if you actually divide it into two, you have to update the uh, possibly a linear number. Okay. Okay, I see that it's getting a bit confusing. Maybe I should start by saying this thing. Maybe I shouldn't have gone directly into this. Hold that thought for the time being. I'm going to come back to that. Let me first define what a dynamic tree data structure is. Okay. <coughs> Suppose I tell you that we will be doing fully dynamic connectivity. However, the underlying graph has a very specific structure that is always a forest. There are no cycles whatsoever. Can you maintain that? Okay. That is what a dynamic tree data structure does. How it does, we will see in later lectures. Both incremental and decremental. Because if we wanted to maintain a dynamic forest, in the incremental setting, we could just do this. The hard part is doing decremental. Okay. And for the time being, just take it on faith that this can be done. 
Hon Dynamic Voice. And in fact, there is a complete zoo out there. I mean, of different data structures. One is called ST trees, one is called top trees, then Euler two trees, linker trees. I'll, I myself cannot count all these things. Same. Exactly the same queries, okay? In fact, you can support some stronger queries as well. Say, for example, using ST tree data structure, you can support this query that, okay. So, not ST3, I mean, okay, let us say top tree. I'm not even going to specify this data structure. You are given a node V. This V belongs to some tree, right? And now you can return how many nodes this tree contains in constant or log in time. Or suppose each of these nodes has a key value okay associated with it and you can query that okay this is a node v return the node with minimum key value in the tree that contains v that also you can do in login time you can also support some very strong updates i mean you can store a value at each of these edges and then you can say you can do this update, say add value. U V and let us say let me give you a value X. What it is going to do? It's going to look at this path from U to V and it is going to increase the value of each edge in this path by X. And it is going to do this in log n time, regardless of how long this path is. Okay. I'm not going to list all these things because in the next week I'm going to devote at least one lecture to this dynamic tree data structure. But I thought it might be more interesting if I start with a very celebrated result in dynamic algorithms itself. Because this dynamic tree data structure predates the field of dynamic graph algorithms. It existed from 70s and so on. Okay. So for the time being, all you need to ask know is that you can maintain these trees dynamically. How you do that? We will come to that later on. Does that answer your question that how are we going to adjust the markers? It's going to do some implicit crazy thing. I'm going to do that. Okay. So the hard part. Now let us return to this. Let us do a recap. What are we saying? We are maintaining a spanning forest. For the time being, assume there is only one component. And the hard part in decremental connectivity is when a tree edge gets deleted. And we want to find if there exists a replacement edge or not. How are we going to find this replacement edge? The dynamic tree data structure can give us this thing. That okay, if you just look at this subtree, TU, it can give us all the non-tree edges that are incident to this subtree. Do you see what I mean? From outside. Not from outside. Just all the edges that are incident to. So it can it will contain these edges as well. It will contain possibly some edges like this or some edges like this. Okay. You can maintain these edges with your data structure in your dynamic tree data structure. But this is not sufficient, right? Because there can be so many of them. Maybe there is this one replacement edge and you are foolishly probing all these edges and you probe a lot of these edges before you find this one. And this is going to take huge update time. Clear? Okay. Maybe for every edge you keep the number of the replacement edges which go across say for UV. Mm -hmm. You keep the number of replacement edges which go from TU to, to D. Suppose this initially you have it. And now when they delete it's a non-tree edge, I can use this add value UVX and find this one from all of them. So you know the problem what will that be? That's a very nice thought. Very nice idea. But the problem will be say for this UV, you are keeping a list of these replacement edges. It's a number. Just the number, then how are you going to find this one? Yeah, so initially, suppose I pre-process like 
at the very beginning, I do some, I spend some time, I find this, that, like pre-crossing, before any update comes. Mm -hmm. Now when update comes, suppose the update is deleting a non-tree edge. Mm -hmm. Suppose I'm deleting the uh, edge, mm -hmm. some edge in... Okay, you are going to decrease this count over this path. Over this entire mm -hmm. path from that. Yes, fine. You want to be two. Fine, I got that. And now when I delete, when I want to delete UV, mm -hmm. if that count is zero, then I know that there is no replacement edge. Okay, if that suppose that count is three, how are you going to find that edge? Do we need, I don't need to do anything. I should I? You need to maintain this forest, right? You need to have the. But the connectivity doesn't change. Can't change. <laughs> Later on, this edge will get deleted. Then what will you do? Do you see the problem? Okay, but that's a very nice thought. I mean, very nice idea. Okay, good. So the point is that how are you going to find this specific edge? That is the point. Now, those of you who are familiar with amortized analysis, okay, what can be one very high level intuition as to how are we going to amortize? It's going to give us an amortized polylog and update time. I am telling you upfront. It's This idea is not going to lead us to worst case update time. So, for one deletion, we might have to probe lot of these edges. But I am claiming, for the time being, assume we do not find any replacement edge. Okay? We just probe through all these edges and see that all of them are inside. But we spent a lot of time. So, there was no such edge. There was no such edge. All the edges were here and we very foolishly what we did was we just probed all these things. Spent a lot of time and later on realized that we have been fooled. This actually got disconnected. But I am claiming that this actually shows that some nice thing has happened. Although we are spending much time on probing these edges on later occasions, we can say that that bad event is not going to happen too much. What is it? I am going to give you one more clue. Just one second. I am just going to give you one more concrete clue. We are going to amortize by saying that you cannot probe a non-tree edge, say more than polylog n times. So, take any specific non-tree edge. It got probed in this iteration. It was a bad event because it was a futile work. It didn't help us. But it's not going to happen more than polylog n times. This is how we are going to amortize. Okay. Now, can anyone see that what is the good thing that is happening when you are probing so many non-tree edges? Which means that the, I mean, there is a lot of connectivity in TU. Mm -hmm. After that, if we delete a tree edge from TU, then we will find uh, replacement edges with... Uh, That's a very nice explanation. It's almost there. I'm going to slightly quantify it. What you are saying, it's more or less the same thing. Anyone else? For every edge, we could mark out different, uh, I mean, for every pre edge, right? We could find out which other replacement edges. Then, whenever I create some other edge, then I'll have to So, for example, if you move these two, UV, you are saying for every edge you... So if you look inside this tree, right, take a blue edge inside this tree. Mm -hmm. So between the endpoints of these two, so you know uh, that if I delete... Okay, let us say this is X and this is Y. Yeah, so say the third vertex is Z, between the X and Y. Okay, Z, fine. So you can probably find out, a uh, you can note that this blue edge is a replacement edge for the YZ. For YZ. So when you when you uh, test if X Y Z replacement edge for U V, you find that it's not. Mm -hmm. But you can note down that it's a replacement edge for uh, Y Z or X Z. No, but this path might be very long, right? Are you going to explicitly note down this thing? See the problem? Okay. Okay, uh, some very good ideas. Let me give you the concrete clue. I mean, it's uh, I do not expect that somebody will solve this problem because it took people 10 years to so find this idea. <laughs> so, uh, the thing is this. Suppose we fail to find any replacement edge. Then what is happening? Let us do one quick trick. 
there is this tree TU, there is this tree TV. Let us say we are just going to look at the smaller tree TU, right? Why should we look at the larger tree? Go to the smaller tree and go through all the non-tree edges, okay? And you fail to find the replacement edge. What does it mean? That for each such edge, say x, y, the connected component it belongs to has halved. Earlier, the size of the connected component was Tu plus Tv. And now the size of the connected component is only Tu. And this cannot happen more than log n times, right? So, so each time, suppose you probed all these non-tree edges and you could not find a replacement edge. Then for each of these non-tree edges, the connected component it belongs to has halved. Okay. So, initially, let us say, T is the union of Tu plus Tv. What is the size of T? The size of T is some k. By size of t, I mean just the number of nodes in t. And without loss of generality, let us just assume that tu is less than t. Then we can say that the size of tu is less than k over 2. Now, look at this node x, y. And let us just ask that initially the connected component x, y belonged to. What was the size of that connected component? It was k. And after this failed operation, the size of the connected component that x, y belongs to has halved. It has now become k over 2. Right? Now, can you see the correction here that this cannot happen more than log n times? I mean, I am being very hand wavy here because I am ignoring several details. Yes? But you are assuming that the case that indeed that UV is a backstage. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's why I am saying that I am being hand wavy here. I am now going to fix that thing. That's a valid objection. But this is the most high level idea. How are we going to amortize? Any question about this high level idea? In the case where there are many replacement edges, but we can still. Waste lot of time. No, this is the case that is no replacement. Yes. Only in this case. Right? Yes. So suppose I, I, I'm just now going to give you a wrong proof, but this wrong proof will lead us to the right argument. One more. So when we are going through the non-tree edges, mm -hmm. so we are not considering edges which go out of T. So basically, this may be one connected component. There will be other connected components. Edges that are going out of. Yes, there is only one connected component. Out of T, R, T. Oh, we are okay, okay. There are other components. Okay, that is easy. Suppose there are th these three components. Okay. Yeah. Now, can there ever be a non-tree edge going out here? Why is there no component? It cannot, right? So the non tree edges will only go. That's why I said, I mean, it doesn't matter. Just assume this one component for the time. Okay? So here is the wrong proof. The wrong proof is that we are going to show that the, our update time is dominated by the number of times we are probing a non tree edge. And each non tree edge cannot be probed more than log n times. Why? Because let us assume that this simple event is happening every time we delete a tree edge and then the connected component's size is getting halved. Okay. Now, coming back to Sackett's object, objection. What is the objection? The objection is that what happens if we actually find a replacement edge? Then the size of the connected component did not get halved, right? So this is not a complete valid argument. Okay. Okay. Rest assured that I, I, I'm not going to do this whole thing in this hand wavy manner. I'm going to do a detailed algorithm, but I thought it will be better to get the high level idea first. Okay. So the bad case is you actually found a replacement edge. Then you said that okay, let me delete this. Let me add this thing back. 
Now I have proved this edge x y but the size of the component remains the same. Now any idea how to fix this? I claim that you can fix this. Just extend the same idea that I described before. Yeah, so when we, uh, if we delete that replacement edge again, uh, then we know which edges we have already, uh, for, for UV, I mean we wrote down that that replacement edge is a replacement for the edge UV. Okay. And then uh, we know which of the edges we have already querying for UV. So we won't query those edges again. Okay, let me get this thing straight. Let this be E, okay? And suppose we have queried here E1, E2. Yeah. You are saying that we will not query E1 and E2 again? Yeah, if we are deleting E. If we are deleting E. Then we don't want to query E1 and E2 Because for, I mean, whatever it is, go across. No, but we may not delete E, right? There is an adversary sitting there. He might delete ZX. This edge in the next step. Right? See the point? I mean, how are you assuming that only this edge E will be deleted in the next step? Maybe some edge here gets deleted. And then this E1, E2 you have to probe again. Yes, but that will be, I mean, so what I'm saying is that for the TUTV bipartition, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we will probe for this bipartition, we will probe non three edges only once. I mean, non, uh, sorry, non, uh, yeah, non three edges only once. So then deleting ZX could have come even if we, I mean, that case would have come anyways if we did not find any replacement there. <laughs> Okay, now look at this edge E1, right? How many possible bipartitions can there be with respect to E1? Order of n, right? So for each possibility, each such possibilities, E1 will be probed once, right? Is it okay, the objection? Okay. So the idea is, we are going to extend this argument that the connected component size is getting halved. But how can we extend this? We will just create a new subgraph where this is happening. What does this mean? It means, let me draw this thing again here. Okay. This is U. This is V. Okay, let me draw many many edges here since TV is much bigger. Okay, this is V. UV gets deleted. And let this graph be. This is the initial graph, right? UV gets deleted. What we first do? We just visit these three edges. Okay, uh, this TU. The three edges in TU, we just visit them. This is TU, this is TV. Visit the white edges here and create a new graph which contains these white edges. Okay, let us say this is G prime. And this is a proper subgraph of G, right? Then, go back here and keep on exploring the non free edges coming out of TU. Okay? And suppose there was an edge, right? This is the good edge, say XY, the replacement edge. But before you hit XY, you have already probed many non free edges E1, E2, E3, and you found that they all lied within EU. So each time you are probing E1, you just put it back here. I mean, just make a copy of E1 in this graph. Each time you probe E2, make a copy here. E3. Then you do E3, make a copy here. 
Finally, you hit x y. What you do? Just make x y the replacement stage and stop. Stop making any copy here. Now, what has happened? I'm just. It seems that I have created one more graph, right? But why is it helping me? It's helping me because. E1 now appears in these two graphs, right? But in the lower graph, the connected component E1 belongs to, its size has become halved. And this thing cannot go on for more than log n steps. So we will maintain a laminar family of graphs. Initially, it will be the entire graph then a subgraph of that, then a subgraph of that, and so on. The next step update, how does the subgraph change? The next step update comes from TV. Like okay. You, need to submit from TV. you just do the same thing? You create a copy of here? The, the new conductive format is power. So suppose there are uh, N uh, what color? N square root N is going to be your Q and D. Okay. Okay. And now we're like one by one all the square root N is crossing D and D. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this graph look like after that? Okay. Let me just this. You are saying that there are square root of N such edges. Going outside D and D and then I am going to delete one after another these edges. Okay? Because each time, at least up to written steps, I will find all the what they call replacement edges because there are so many. Right? How does this graph change? Okay, good question. Suppose you delete this edge again, then. I realize that there is something wrong here because if you delete this edge, okay, here is the answer. Now you assign a level to each edge. The level of an edge will denote whether it belongs to G or it belongs to G prime. Right now we have only two levels, okay? What Saket was asking was that first we deleted UV. Then we found that okay, xy is a replacement edge. Now we are going to delete xy. Right? If we again have to go through e1, e2, e3, then we are in a bad scenario, right? We have to avoid going through e1, e2, e3. How are we going to do that? Earlier we have probed e1, e2, e3 and we have pushed them down to G prime. So we will create a marker, a level here that will say that okay these edges have already been pushed down. Okay. So right now let us say we start with the highest level, let that be capital N and let this level here be N minus 1. When XY gets deleted, we are now going to go through the non tree edges here whose levels are L and not L minus 1 because the edges whose levels are L minus 1 we know that they are not going to help us because they already lie in this component. So next time we are going to go through some other additional edges and each time we fail we are going to 
to get this thing down here. So we mark this xy also as some some other label L, saying that that was added at. Yes, it will be the same level. X Y currently is at the same level. That is special because that was, this was added. Yes. At level N. Yes. Yes. So suppose uh, we don't delete X Y directly, we delete some edge of P U. Some edge here you are saying, right? Then which edge is to be present? Then we have to write uh, edges from both levels. One second. The subgraph of the prime is from that to the U for it, right? Exactly, that is the point. Good. Who said that? Oh, you are already you almost got the whole algorithm. Okay. This is good. So the question was: suppose here is this edge, E prime. Now E prime is deleted. What do you do? You need to find a replacement edge. You do not find a replacement edge here. You go here. And only when you fail here, then you will come back here. Right? Because here you have edges of level L minus 1. So E gets deleted. E prime gets deleted. You first see if E prime has a replacement edge of level L minus 1. If you fail, then you come here and here you again look for only replacement edges of level N only. So is the high level idea clear? What is going on? If you, if you go one more round, hmm. L minus 1 to L minus 2, right? Yes. Three, a little bit more clear. Why do you only we have, we will create such a graph only for blocking steps because that is what you have been. You are pushing something here. At some point in time, you can push even further, you can push further, push further. The answer is in GL, the maximum size of a connected component is n. In GL minus 1, the way we have constructed is the maximum size of a connected component is n over 2. In the next level, the maximum size of a connected component will be n over 4. And so on. Okay. So, okay. I have a question to you that suppose if some decrement, decrement happens, mm -hmm. in which level should I start searching for replacement? I mean, how, how is this replacement? Yes, I am going to now describe the entire algorithm. The answer is that you just go to the lowest level where that age appeared and start searching upwards from there. So, one moment. Mm -hmm. So you said when you delete that edge. Which one? E, e yeah. Okay. You start from level L minus 1. Mm -hmm. And if you don't succeed, you will come there. Yes. Do you also push edges down to L minus 2? Yes, exactly. 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 And each of these levels will have multiple. Sorry? Connected uh, components. This graph G. So for example, uh, this TU was of size uh, K by 4. This TU? Okay. Here it will be of size k by 8. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And the next time I drop an edge on dv, I mean delete an edge on dv. Mm -hmm. So the smallest will be the, in the other side something way. So you will get two connected components. Yes, yes. So that will be there in each yes. case. Yes, there will be the multiple the connected components. components. Yes. Okay. So uh, this was just the idea. Now I am going to describe the algorithm. Let me see how much time I have. Yes, any question? So, yes. Uh, continuing on means uh, mm -hmm. parts, fine. So, uh, if I am looking at the tree, at the top there sits this uh, tree as in like uh, the way we are represent. So, at the top I have this entire graph G, mm -hmm. right? Then uh, I happen to be one level down. Mm -hmm. At L minus one, I could have multiple graphs here. Yes. What about the branching here? It's bounded by two. Oh, how many graphs you can have? Ah, how many? Okay, so the precise question is how many graphs can I have at level L minus one? No, of course, at most n over two, right? Because. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I take it back. At most n. The branching can be high. I mean, you don't know. You were asking that, okay, if you go down one level, what is the branching? How many more connected components you get? That can be very high. But you don't care because ultimately there are at most n nodes. There are n nodes in each level, right? But 
wouldn't that just be the so I know that this that is bounded by a login mm -hmm. and that's the range which I'm looking for. Yes. yes. So I expect that branching will also be bounded by at least a constant factor or not. No, no, see the branching is not the branching. It's not the Because you are deleting an edge, now you could delete some, so some other edge and get some other stuff there and this would be an so there is a variant that at every level the like some of all the word is and which are because it's just as every level you store the vertex. The vertices are stored at every level. The only thing is that you have login levels and each level is a subgraph of the previous level. That's it. Okay? So uh, after adding the replacement text, mm -hmm. after deleting something from T, we again do the same thing. Do we again go down to the minus one? If you are deleting something here, yeah. Yeah. suppose you delete something here, yeah. which one is the smaller half? This one? Yeah. You just push this thing down here. So it, it just go through all these edges, create this yeah, so tree here. Like this. Suppose this was a lower path, then I know I don't need to look at anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the worst case, it can happen that we are starting from the lower level and we have to go up to the elect uh, level to search for the elect. Exactly. This is not worst case bound. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. You are talking about amortized. No. Sorry, I, I missed your question. Can you please repeat that again? So what I'm saying is that it can be that uh, to find a replacement age for some, uh, when I'm deleting some age, I'm looking from the lowest level to the elite level, and I'm, uh, it's, I, I don't see if the, even if the amortized is giving you much. Uh, you were saying that we will have login levels of the subgraphs, but uh, if you are looking through all the levels from the lowest to the top, how many edges you are probing? You are probing all the edges you could have in the original graph. Uh, exactly, you are probing many edges for one update. But the point is that each time you are probing a non-tree edge at some level, and you are finding out that that is not a replacement edge, you are decrementing its level by one. So if you just now go edge by edge, if you just pick one edge, how many times will it be proved over the entire duration of the algorithm? Once it becomes a tree edge, it's fine, right? It can only get deleted. If it is a non-tree edge, each time it is being probed, its level is being decremented by one. Because I'm not seeing how the level, decrementing the level is helping in not counting it in the probing. No. Okay. First of all, if you look at any one uptick in the input graph, it might take a whole lot of time to fix this thing. Agreed? How are we going to analyze the total time, the amortized time? We are going to say that let us just count how many times an edge is being probed during its lifetime. If we say that each edge is probed at most login times, you started from some graph n. In the end, you found an empty graph. You are considering the decremental setting for the time being, right? If you say that throughout this entire span, each edge has this property, that it has been probed at most log n times. Do you see that it will imply a log n amortized time? No, oh, but you said we can't, uh, we can't, uh, I mean, for amortized and decremental connectivity, we can't take the initial uh, number of it. No, no, no. Okay, suppose you okay, suppose I am just going to give you the following guarantee, okay? You start with a graph G with images. With images, okay? Then you just delete all of them one after another. You end up with an empty graph and you now ask what is the total update time? 
something is you have to start with the whatever you said, I mean, air engines, and then you, do, I mean, you don't go down to the empty ground. You okay, okay, good point. It's not going to imply an amortized bound until you end up with an empty graph. Fine. That is that clear why it is going to imply? Okay. So now I think I have around 20 minutes. We started 10 minutes late. 20 or 15 minutes. So what I will do is I will describe the invariant. And if we don't manage to finish it today, we will continue with the next week's lecture. Okay, so uh, basically what this algorithm, now we are doing fully dynamic connectivity, okay. This is dynamic connectivity that we are doing. We are not considering decremental connectivity anymore. I am just going to give you the full algorithm. So basically, we are going to maintain a hierarchical decomposition of the edge set into log n levels. So the highest level E log n is the entire edge set E. This is a superset of these edges till you go to level I, then you go to level Z. How is this hierarchical decomposition defined? Each edge gets a level. And this level E is between log n to 0 for all E. Now, what is this set EI? Can anyone tell us how will you define EI with respect to these levels? Going back to our previous algorithm. Can you correct me the number of times it has been probed? No, I am just saying forget about the number of times it has been probed. I am just giving you the levels, okay? So, yes, second edges with a level greater than or equal to one. Less than or equal to one. Appeared till that level, right? And the next level, it didn't appear. Yes. So, doesn't it just mean this? Okay, let me just write it down. It's the set of edges in E. Oh, sorry, I took it back. You are right. You are right. No. Because what is E log n? It's the kind that how we started. Yes. Then, e, then it, all the edges will have level less than or equal to log n, right? If I have a log, so my name is level i. I only want to probe edges of level n. I don't want to probe lower levels. Also. Yes. So since it's just a log e equal to l. Just not at this point. No, we are not talking about probing. We are just defining this hierarchical part oh, with respect to the levels. Okay. okay? Next. Uh, so the levels are defined. Now there is this notation that F is the spanning, is a spanning forest of the entire graph and the spanning forest is also being decomposed, okay. So basically if I is a spanning forest, in GI. Okay, this is what we had. And these spanning forests are also called, they also constitute a laminar family. 
okay now what we can say about this spanning forest so, 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 yes. so at any point uh, a tree edge has level 0 no no a tree edge can have level down in as well because initially no, no, no. Initially, just look at this argument again, right? Initially, we assigned the level log n to each of these guys, and that was a spanning forest. So then there was nothing at level L. Yes. So it's, it's not exist. I mean, like, no, this satisfied all these conditions, right? No, the, the, it satisfies all these conditions that I have maintained, written down, right? I mean, everything was empty. But do you change the levels yeah. of the creatures? No, Sorry? Do you change the levels of the Yes, of course. We are going. Huh? Do do no, when this edge is going to be deleted, we are going to change. Suppose, okay. Just recall the first example. Initially, all these edges had level log n. Then this edge got deleted. What we did? We just decremented the levels of all the three edges to log n minus 1. I thought we deleted this, uh, so we broke down the non three edges until we found the replacement edge, and for all the edges that were already broke, we decreased the level to. No, 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 no. We didn't take the entire sample. No, yeah, as a subgraph, we took the whole of. I mean, we took we took all the three edges of T U and the non three edges that were broke while finding the replacement edge at that point. Yes, but but it means you decremented all the levels of the tree edges you cannot leave some of the edges here at level log in anymore so for the non tree edges of course there will be some non tree edges remaining here which you have not touched but all the tree edges you must ensure that they go down because otherwise it will no longer be consistent right okay Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, all edges have level log in. In the decremental setting. In the right. decremental setting. So, uh, my g i for i at the very beginning at least, for i less than log in, e i is 0, e i yes. is null set. Yes. So, how is f i a spanning for us in g i? It's not spanning. There are no edges to span at all. Is that okay, let's just define if you have an empty edge set, a spanning forest is empty set. Okay, this is a bit more to just have the, all this three edges go down and just. Okay, fine. Ah. Uh, okay, maybe it will work out the way you are saying, but let's just go ahead with this, okay? Okay, now all I am asking is just to get some intuition, can you tell me anything about this FI? It's a spanning forest in GI, but there are so many possible spanning forests, right? Just look at this condition. I mean, these two conditions are independent of each other, right? One condition says that FI is a spanning forest of EI. The other one is says that FI is contained completely in FI plus 1. So from these two, what can we infer about FI? More finer, sir. Sorry? It's finer. Like, no, the, it's a subforest of FI plus 1. Yes, that's just is saying this condition in words, right? So from FI plus 1, delete it. Delete it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I claim this is what I was trying to get at. Claim is that if I is a minimum spanning forest in EI with respect to the levels. With respect to the levels C where E belongs to here. So if you just treat these levels as weights, FI has to be a minimum spanning forest. Minimum weight spanning forest. Yes, minimum weight spanning forest. Now I'm going to draw a picture and maybe we have to stop here. Why is that? And I claim if you just, okay, 
suppose you are given these levels L E, right? These are given to you. And I just tell you construct this laminar family. All you can do is just start bottom up. F0, find a minimum spanning forest in E0. Then just augment it to get a minimum spanning forest in E1. Because you can construct minimum spanning forest in greedy way, right? So how will you construct a minimum spanning forest in E? You first look at all the edges that have level 0. Find a spanning forest there. Then try to see, okay, now I'm going to do this thing, okay. So, yes, it's just two skulls algorithm, right? So, uh, suppose you have a spanning forest here, this is F0. Now the non, this is a spanning forest in E0. And E0 will also consist of these dashed edges. Okay, and they all fly in this component. Then you go one level up. You add this thing into your F1 and just keep on doing this. Can you visualize this thing? Because unless you visualize this thing, it's going to be difficult. Continue. Hmm? Why does the level won't increase beyond log and is it not the people of it? No, it is from I mean it will not go from beyond the log. Okay, now I'm just going to give you that final invariant. Okay? The so what am I saying is that the properties that the algorithm will maintain. I'm just going through the properties one after another, okay? So far, I have not told you one property. The final invariant is that, this is another invariant, that for all level i, Every connected component in GI contains at most two to the power I nodes. This also comes from the informal description we had of the algorithm before. Right? And this tells you why it cannot go beyond log n. Okay? So what I have described so far is basically the properties the algorithm will satisfy. The algorithm will just maintain this structure. That's it. Clear? Okay, so I think maybe it's better to stop here because if I'm going to do the formal analysis. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I mean, I'm just going to spend two more minutes. Let me just give you the references. Okay, let me write down the reference. Okay, the algorithm I'm currently presenting, it's from this paper. called polylogarithmic
and the journal version appeared in JCM 2001. The conference action is probably three years back. Uh, and also you might want to look up uh, Eric Demain's lecture notes. They have, he has some great, great lecture notes in his web page. You can also look it up. So the course is called Advanced Data Structures. And I think it's lecture 20. And it was in 2012. Okay. 